Hey everybody, today we're going to walk through some of the basics for the Unified Canvas. The purpose of the Unified Canvas is to allow you to create and composite a perfect image using AI-assisted technologies. Whether you're starting from an image that was created using AI or you're augmenting an image that you've created, the Unified Canvas is a great way to bring together AI tooling and more creative control. To start, we'll take this image that was generated. It's not cherry picked and it is not perfect in any way, shape or form. And we'll talk through how we can make some of the modifications to turn this into something that we can use. Very often when you're using AI technologies, you'll find something that's close, but not perfect or that you want to iterate on. And the Unified Canvas is a good way to take that next step of iterating on that image. In order to get started with an image on the Unified Canvas, you can either navigate to the Unified Canvas and drag it on, or from any image inside of the studio, you can hit the three dot menu and send to the canvas. That'll bring it directly to that tab. Now, before we dig into editing this image, if you have not watched the image to image getting started video, I definitely encourage going back and familiarizing yourself with that concept as it will be a key concept for you in this video. So let's talk about a couple of the new things that are added to your workflow and toolkit inside of the canvas. The first I'll touch on is our layer. As of this video, there are two layers that you can edit directly on the canvas, the base layer and the mask layer. The base layer is where you'll make changes directly to the image content that will be going into the denoising process. You can use the brush tool on the base layer to add new colors and structure into your image. And this is making direct modifications to the underlying image layer. The mask layer allows you to select the portions of the image that you want to have changed by the canvas process. This is a technique called in painting. In painting is what we'll use in order to make edits to smaller details in the image, add new content into regions that we've drawn in a sketch or rough color block to guide the generation process, and is a very powerful tool for modifying and transforming what's in an image. You can easily switch between the mask and the base layer by pressing the Q hotkey, and I encourage you to familiarize yourself with that as it's one of the easiest ways to get into flow when you're editing on the canvas. Just to show an example of that, I'll press the B key, which is our brush hotkey. And as I'm currently on the mask layer, I'm able to select regions that I'd like to edit. The selection is displayed as kind of this uh, region of marching lines. And if I'm editing an image where it's hard to tell because of the colors, what region is selected, I can go to my masking options and change that color to whatever I prefer. You also do have a couple of options related to the masks in this drop down menu. You can use the H hotkey to toggle your mask on and off, which is useful if you want to hide it for visibility purposes or keep the mask that you've selected, but do some other iterations without it enabled. I can save that mask out if I want to use that for any reason, that'll put that directly in my gallery. And I can also clear the mask entirely. As I mentioned previously, I might go through and select certain regions press the Q hotkey to switch to my brush. Whatever color I have selected at the time is going to automatically be used. And I can then manually draw in new content or colors inside of my image. So for a quick demonstration of how this might work in a workflow, I'll go ahead and clear my mask and we'll start from the beginning. Let's ask ourselves what we wanna do here in this image. Perhaps I've decided that, you know, this corduroy jacket really isn't the vibe I'm going for. I like the pants, but I wanna change the color of this jacket. I currently have a black transparent color selected for my brush. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is mask over some of the regions of this jacket and then update this region using in painting. In order to make my brush bigger or smaller, I can go to my brush settings or I can use my control and scroll wheel to increase or decrease the brush size. I can also use the left bracket and right bracket hotkeys on the keyboard. Both of these are great tools to familiarize yourself with so that you can really edit quickly on the canvas.
So I've noticed that I've gotten a little bit too far over here on the left-hand side. While the diffusion process would probably fix this for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my color picker. The color picker can be also selected using the C hotkey. I'm going to pick some of this white color over here, and I'm just going to brush that in. Now I'm going to switch to my mask layer, increase my brush size, and select the regions that I want to have edited. Now one thing to note when we're in painting is that we're going to be asking the AI model to reinterpret what is inside of this image. In this case, I want to turn this from a orange corduroy jacket into a brown leather jacket. So what we need to do is make sure that our prompt matches what we're looking to see and what we want to suggest to the AI model that it's looking at. One thing to note is that it needs all of the context for what is inside of this image. And it is looking at everything inside of this dotted box. This dotted box is called the bounding box. And what it does is effectively tells the AI where to focus its attention for this generation and what our prompt is going to be describing. Everything inside of the bounding box should match to what the prompt describes. In this case, we're going to change our prompt to a brown leather jacket, orange pants, and that'll help give some of that context for what the model is seeing. Again, we're not really changing a whole lot about the pants, but everything that's inside of this bounding box is relevant for the purposes of prompting to get the image we want. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the bounding box mechanisms and ways that you can use it to guide your generations. But for now, let's go ahead and invoke. Now we've gotten a good jacket out of this update and effectively changed that portion of the image. Whenever we use the canvas to generate new content, we're going to be presented with what's known as the staging area. This presents a small toolbar on the bottom and allows us to create multiple iterations of the same content. If we like this one and want to keep it, we can hit the accept button that will apply this and commit this directly to the base layer of our image. We're essentially rolling this forward into future canvas iterations or we can discard this in order to delete it and continue moving on with our original image. If we ever need to peek at our original image, we can turn the show results on and off, and that helps us compare the before and after of our generations. We can also always save these generations to the gallery by hitting the Save button. If we're not entirely sure that we want to keep this one, but we want to see a couple of other options from the staging area, if you create new invocations, you'll add those to your staging area. With our two added generations, we now see that we have three, and we can either hit the left or right arrow or the left and right arrow key on our keyboard in order to switch between the generations. You can see which we prefer, and then when we decide what we like, we can hit accept and move on. So I'll hit shift C, and delete that mask. And we can talk about how to pack in more detail inside of your image. We'll notice that our model's face here is not perfect. It's a couple of odd details. His hands look a little strange and his shoes have some details that aren't really perfect. Those are areas that we can easily enhance using in painting. With many models, when you have characters or objects that are further in the background, those are more prone to artifacts. There might be small irregularities, strange elements that need to be edited out, or it just doesn't look as good as something that is larger in, an, in a generated image. That's where the power of the bounding box allows us high degrees of control and the ability to add fine grained details like improved faces, small embellishments, and crisper details. By default, the bounding box is set to a mode that's called scale before processing. What scale before processing does is ensures that the image that you're generating is using the maximum amount of power available to you with the model you have selected. As we mentioned in previous videos, models are trained to generate images at a specific size. With SDXL, we're looking at 1024 by 1024 or roughly around there. 
with the other aspect ratios. What Scale Before Processing does is allows us to use and generate images at that size even when we're editing smaller regions of the image. In this example, even though our bounding box is selecting a region of the image that's just under 400 pixels by 400 pixels, the scale before processing feature will generate the image at 1024 by 1024, and then take all of that detail it's been able to generate and composite that directly into the smaller region on the image. In this case, we're going to try to see if we can add some better details to our model's face. So we need to do a few things to make sure that we're ready to run this generation. We'll go ahead and select the portion of the face that we want to edit, mostly the facial features here, and we'll double check what's in our prompt box so that we've mapped it to what is inside of this bounding box. This can trip people up because they're thinking about the specific region that they're editing in the context of the entire image. And it's often useful to think about this as getting rid of everything else and figuring out what prompt would adequately describe what's left. So in this case, we'll go ahead and focus just on the man himself. We'll do a close-up of a man in a brown jacket, and we'll leave our denoising strength as is at 0.65, which is a healthy medium between generating new details and keeping a lot of the structure that's left that's already in the image. Now we have two new looks for our model, and if we compare them to the original, we can tell that there's just a much better sense of detail and depth to these new images. We'll go ahead and save this one. And you can imagine how this process might go from top to bottom in editing some of these details. I'll just go ahead and run through that real quick. We've now made some good edits to our image. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my canvas, and we'll talk about some of the ways that you can start your creative process directly on the canvas. If you don't have an existing image that you want to bring in, you have the ability to simply start directly on the canvas and have your generation pop in on the first layer. So in this case, we'll do professional photography, outdoors, landscape, sunset, behind a mountain vista. So we have our new generations here. We can choose which one we like to keep. We can also, again, save those to the gallery. We'll save this one. And now we'll talk about how we can extend images. We'll go through two mechanisms, one, the automatic infill, and the other, a manual infill, to show how you can extend images using the colors that are in the image or that you supply. We'll go ahead and move our bounding box to the left. One thing that's important when outpainting is that you want to make sure that you have enough context from your original image to help inform what is going to be generated in the empty space. The basic process for outpainting using the unified canvas is that colors from the original image will be extracted, placed underneath, depending on your infill method, and then that inpainting process will happen over that new region that you are creating. What that means is that if you don't have enough of your original image inside of your bounding box when you start the generation, it won't have a lot of colors to source from. And you'll end up with something that looks significantly different than your original image. I typically find that a good rule of thumb is the rule of threes. You want one third of the image to be empty at most. And that'll make sure that you have enough content to generate a good outpainting. There are four infill methods. I'll include links to some of the documentation around the infill methods. Effectively, they just provide a different mechanism for pulling color from the original image into this area. By default, the infill method is set to patch match, and I typically leave it on this for most use cases because it's a really strong mechanism for getting that infill. It's also a good reminder to reset your denoising strength when you're doing 
out painting. This control is exposed so that you have more flexibility in determining how much you want the new colors that are being outpainted to be transformed. But as a good rule of thumb, leaving it at the default of 0.7 is again a good balance. Let's go ahead and generate this outpainting. If when you're generating outpainting, you notice a C, that's not entirely uncommon. It can happen in your generations, and there are a few ways to control for it. You can play around with your denoising strength, but one of the features that is exposed inside of the canvas is the coherence pass section of the compositing dropdown. Each time a generation is done on the canvas, we're running a two-step process in order to generate the image, and then we're sticking those two together. The area where they're being stuck together is blurred together using your blur method. And so in this case, it's only blurring about 10 pixels. If we increase that to about 32, we'll see that that becomes a bigger region. We might also choose to increase our denoising strength. We'll generate another two. In this case, a lot of the structural irregularities were fixed. There still are a couple areas that we might want to finish out ourselves. Fortunately, this is really easy with the canvas. We can directly manipulate those regions using end painting, and we can use the brush to help ease some of the transitions. then select those regions and run our inpainting. Although we may want to play around with our denoising strength so that everything fits in. Now the second technique we'll talk about is manual infills. On the left-hand side, we allowed the system to automatically pull colors out, generate the base layer, and then perform that in painting step on top. We can do that process manually if we prefer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that my opacity is up all the way, and I'm just gonna use the brush to source some colors and roughly block in what I'm thinking about in my mind. And I'll leave this pretty blocky. We'll keep the denoising strength a little high. And we'll manually select the region that we want to outpaint here. I'm updating my prompt to add that tree in. And we'll give this a go. Now what we're going to need to do if we're adding in something as complicated as this tree is we're going to need to really make sure that there's a clear suggestion to the AI model. We have to make sure that it knows what it's looking at and where things are in space. This type of rough blocking is a lot of mixed colors. It's not very clear what's what. And so we have to really add in that artistry to do something like this manually. Now you can see this one was a bit of a challenge, and I think this highlights some of the realities of creative tooling. The more flexibility we have to augment the image, the more we also have the potential to confuse the system, 
and have it not really understand what exactly we're drawing. We'll touch on some advanced ways to offer this type of control in the future using things like IP adapter, control net, so on and so forth. But these basics will help you get started with composited AI editing and also give you some confidence that even when you have some unexpected results, it's okay. Part of this process is exploratory, is figuring out how the tool works and increasingly using that new skill in order to determine how to get what you're looking for from the system. We have one particularly rough spot that I'm going to close out with because the perfectionist in me is wanting to see that fixed. But then we'll have our image and you'll have the basics you need to get started using the tool. Pretty cool. When we're done with whatever we've generated, we can hit the Save to Gallery button on the top, and that'll save that right out to the gallery for us to use later. Again, we'll touch on more advanced tools and techniques on the canvas in the future. Hopefully this was a helpful place to get started and build some confidence as you explore and experiment with this new tool.